I'm back with some news in Linux. This week we're going to be covering a lot, so let's get right into it. Fedora 43 misses its early target for October 21st. The release was declared a no-go due to unresolved blocker bugs and insufficient testing coverage. The new aim here is October 28th, and currently there are 10 accepted blockers that span the Anaconda installer, GDM GNOME shell, and hardware regressions. So due to these outstanding blocker bugs, sadly people are going to be waiting to use Fedora Linux 43 at least until October 28, 2025. And this mainly has to do with four accepted blockers. Now we've actually updated some of those. There are three proposed blockers, four of them currently accepted. There were around 10. And here are the four things holding up Fedora 43 currently from being released. Anaconda Web UI on KD produces unusable. Configuration when selecting Russian. Keyboard layout. KD drop down menu in Anaconda does not work in default host only mode, sloppy results in significant increase in init RAM file system size. And finally, in Linux firmware, regression in the MediaTek MT7922 Wi Fi driver. In another interesting news, a well known x86 architecture expert, Christian Ludloff, had something cryptic to say about opcode, CPU ID, and MSR allocations. He was asked to relay this to the bin utilities. Linux kernel mailing list. As of 2025, the following are inactive use by a corporate entity other than Intel and AMD. So Christian is saying here that some company, not Intel or AMD, is using a few unused x86 instructions. He also posted this on the bin utilities mailing list as well. And it's just interesting because it strongly suggests another corporate company is entering into the x86 CPU ecosystem and is letting Linux know that it needs to reserve space and prepare support for now without actually giving its name out to the Linux community. It'd be interesting to follow this along and figure out exactly who's getting into the space and that it's a corporate entity instead of some sort of a research firm or people who are just trying to reverse engineer things. We'll be following this along as we don't know who this is exactly at this moment. And now with some big news from the Free Software Foundation. The Free Software Foundation announces the LibreFone project. The Free Software Foundation, also known as FSF, launched LibreFone to make a fully free Android compatible phone operating system, replacing proprietary firmware and blobs where needed. Rob Savoy is leading this charge. Why does this matter? This could unblock mainline support for devices by documenting and replacing the closed pieces benefiting kernels, tool chains, distributions, while targeting mobile devices. It'll give us an ecosystem that's coordinated and well-funded rather than having a few projects that exist that are really hobbyist efforts, hopefully de-Googling the mobile stack. The announcement was made as LibreFone is a new initiative by the FSF with, with the goal of bringing full freedom to the mobile computing environment. The vast majority of software users around the world use a mobile phone as their primary computing device. After 40 years of advocacy for computing freedom, the FSF will now work to bring the right to study, change, share, and modify the programs users depend on in their daily lives to mobile phones. As a LibreFone is not the first to try this. There have been other projects like Lineage OS and Pure OS who have made a lot of progress, but none of them have delivered a widely usable, fully free stack on modern mainstream phone. A lot of them are linked to only one model of phone, and a lot of the efforts have stalled or fell short just because of certain blockers, including proprietary blobs for radios, GPUs, cameras, digital signal processors, which are very hard to reverse engineer. There's also been bootloader locks, verified boot, safety net, and CTS all make it hard to install or keep alternative operating systems. And that's why practically LibreFone aims to close the glass gaps between existing distributions of Android operating system and software freedom. The FSF has hired experienced developer Rob Savoy, who helped create Deja GNU, Nash, OpenStreetMap, and more projects to lead the technical project. He is currently investigating the state of device firmware and binary blobs and other mobile phone freedom projects, prioritizing the free software work done by the not entirely free software mobile phone operating system, Lineage OS. The initial work will be funded by a donation from an FSF board member, John Gilmore, who explained, I have enjoyed using a mobile phone running Lineage OS with Micro G and F Droid for years, which eliminates the spyware and control that Google embeds in the standard Android phones. I later discovered that Lineage OS distribution links in significant proprietary binary modules copied from the firmware of a particular phone. Rather than accept this sad situation, I look for collaborators to reverse engineer and replace those proprietary modules with fully free software for at least one modern phone. So that's the goal here. 
to really just de-Google Android variants that still rely on binary blobs, closed source drivers, and firmware pulled from the original phone manufacturer. We'll see how this all works out, but it is quite a task and it is important Rob's leading this charge as he has deep hands-on experience making complex hardware and low-level systems run on free software. We'll see if this project stands a chance. We'll be following it through. And if you want to keep following it through, make sure to subscribe below and smash that like button. Let's get on to the next piece of news. It's official. Firefox 32-bit Linux support is going to end in 2026 and has been dropped with the latest release of Firefox 145. For many years, Mozilla has continued to provide Firefox for 32-bit Linux systems long after most of the browsers and operating systems ended support. And as of October 14th, 2025, what has changed? Well, starting with Firefox 145, 32-bit Linux is no longer supported. We encourage users to install the 64-bit version of Firefox. Again, this is all to try to end support in 2026. That means all the previous release of the Firefox browser will become deprecated by the end of the year, and you'd be pretty much required to run something newer, 145 on without 32-bit support. For those of you running Firefox still today with 32-bit support, you're gonna have to start looking for a new browser. Interesting news coming out of Firefox. Exciting news in KDE Plasma. This week in KDE Plasma, Plasma 6.5 is nigh. KDE is 29 years old, help us celebrate. And Nate here says, I think it's gonna be a pretty darn good release when it comes out in three days and we're seeing New notable features in Plasma 6.6, including an application dashboard widget that can now configure to follow the color scheme, though it remains dark by default. And we can see the difference here. Boom, here's what it looks like following by default. Keep in mind that the dashboard hasn't had any visual sprucing up in years. In Plasma 6.6 also, the highlights for top level menu items are now slightly rounded. You can see what that looks like right here in the picture below. We also see a few notable bug fixes as well as Framework 6.2 refines KRunner to search behavior and UI consistency. This update mainly polishes stability, fixes HDR and dual monitor support and NVIDIA bugs, improves Wi-Fi credential handling, and adds small UI tweaks like the rounded corners that we saw for the menu highlighting. The dark mode becomes more consistent and resizable dashboard areas also become more consistent. Awesome stuff for us KDE Plasma users out there. Let me know if you're using KDE Plasma in the comment section below. Let's get into something very interesting with a different desktop environment called GNOME. This is an interesting one as GNOME is highlighting a new app release called Lenspect. It's a debut of the first native virus total GUI client for Linux. They're calling this post virus season. So Lenspect, a lightweight security threat scanner powered by VirusTotal. In almost 11 years, this is the first native GUI VirusTotal client developed specifically for the Linux platform and using a modern GNOME technology stack. Stay tuned for updates and new features in the next versions. This is very interesting. As the new Lenspect virus scanner is apparently filling in some sort of a desktop security gap, and since GNOME shows up as the default desktop environment for major distributions, including Ubuntu, Fedora, it's very interesting to see a virus scanning tool. Basically, it looks like it's going to be a tool that's able to use VirusTotal's database to check for security threats on files. Most users that don't run as root and software comes from signed repositories have no issues with malware, but there's also no way to double check things. What if you're using Linux computers and Windows computers and you're sharing files amongst each other? Even though Linux isn't immune, it's very hard to get a virus because not a lot of people focus on actually making viruses or malware for Linux as Windows dominates the desktop. So of course, malware people target the most people, but malware still exists and can be downloaded and pushed through Linux. Examples include Trojans and crypto miners targeting servers. So basically a security tool like this, Lenspect, will help detect infected files regardless of if they're gonna be used on Linux. Think about this being used through shared media or cross-platform malware that could spread to other parts of your home equipment. It's interesting to see, even if your Linux system isn't affected, you can of course still pass on malware to Windows or Android devices. This will be interesting to see how many people end up actually using this tool like Lenspect. Will it actually have a role? Let me know what you think about this new scan tool coming to GNOME. We also have the open source code here under the VM 
KSPV LensSpec public repository. I'm gonna put a link in the description below if you wanna check this out. They call it a lightweight security threat scanner intended to make malware detection more accessible and efficient, specifically on Linux. You can actually install and build it from source or install it today if you really wanna try it out. It comes with a GPL 3.0 license. In another news, on the Linux kernel mailing list, we see a new follow-up discussion which early benchmarks show a 14 to 18% faster Postgres SQL database performance and up to a 30% faster thread creation and teardown performance. The change here is going to improve how the kernel tracks and synchronizes memory contacts between threads and CPUs, reducing contention and scheduler overhead. This was made by Intel engineers via Lintronics and these release kernel patches will rework again the memory management handling. Basically the system bench Postgres benchmark shows our sequence performance going up by 14.7%, the CID rework 3.1% in transactions per second. Interestingly enough, the creator himself saying, I triple checked the upstream versus our sequence performance numbers because I couldn't believe them on first sight. They stayed that way. Performance does not give an obvious explanation, but enabling lightweight counters from the R sequence performance branch shows a significant improvement. We also talk about that teardown and create performance as well with up to a 35 or 30% increase. It's all very interesting as it delivers real world performance gains in database workloads, especially PostgreSQL, which is used alongside many enterprise level servers that host databases as well as home labs. The tests were done on a 128 core server. And this of course is all important to Linux as boosting PostgreSQL and multi-threaded app performance makes Linux even more competitive for the enterprise workloads, cloud infrastructure and data servers. With all these low level optimizations, benefiting users directly. It's nice to see how collaboration between Intel and the Linux kernel community continues on giving us wonderful patches and improvements just like this one. Here's something interesting that I haven't heard in a while. With the XFAT programs 1.3 release, we get a new tool called defrag.xfat, which can defrag XFAT drives or check for fragmentation while using Linux systems. Until now, Linux couldn't defrag XFAT systems, so users had to figure out different ways to defrag their, their drives, even having to plug it into Windows in order to be able to run the defrag process. The new features here is a tool to defragment the XFAT file system or access in its fragmentation status. See the manual page. And you might be asking yourself, for those of you users who haven't heard of defragmenting before, it's the process of reorganizing how data is stored on a disk so that the related pieces of a file are placed next to each other instead of being scattered all over the drive. Imagine trying to search a filing cabinet if all your files are scattered and uncategorized and not next to each other. That's sort of what defragmenting does is it reorganizes things in order to place them next to each other, or closer to each other, so you don't have to seek through the disk as far or quite as often. If you don't defrag, when you save or edit delete files, the operating system often breaks them into smaller chunks called fragments stored in different spots on the disk. Oftentimes, this means a single file might be split into hundreds of parts scattered across the drive. And with that, the disk's read and write head must jump around to assemble it, which of course slows things down because that's a mechanical process. Defragmenting moves file pieces back together so that can sit on one continuous block. So that's why this is important as it will speed up performance on spinning hard disks, HDDs, which a lot of us use for storage still nowadays, especially on databases, media, and large file operations. This will also reduce wear and tear as mechanical drives will have to move minimally when you defrag a hard drive. So it is an interesting tool that Linux users can now use with XFAT drives without needing some other way. Some of us might remember on Windows having to defrag our drives often. Let me know if you use the defrag tool on Windows before as they still have it today. If you type in defrag, you can quote unquote, optimize your drives, but more than likely that operation happens in the background automatically. Let's talk about the LMDE 7 GG release. For those of you that don't know, this stands for Linux Mint Debian Edition. It's officially out version seven. It's basically Linux Mint built directly on Debian instead of Ubuntu. LMDE exists so Mint users can keep its familiar cinnamon desktop, but it includes updated Debian packages and it's typically faster and leaner than Ubuntu based Mint because it uses Debian directly and has long-term stability, which is what's the most important thing to the users of LMDE. Debian slow moving base makes LMDE rock solid. And of course is exciting for users using LMDE. Right now the system requirements are two gigs of RAM, four 
gigs recommended for comfortable usage, 20 gigs of disk space, 100 GB recommended. I'd actually say 32, anything Debian based, I've had issues trying to install in anything under a 32 gig disk before. And that's really it. Everything else seems to be supported. Ton of mirrors available here, so get them for wherever you want. But just wanted to make sure that everyone knows you can now upgrade LMDE or even go to it if you've never heard of it. It's worth a shot, especially if you like stability. This is one of the best Linux distributions to go to. And if you want rock solid stability, this is the best Linux release that you could possibly get. Before we move on, check out my checklist, cheat sheet, and my map, all available at SavvyNick.com. Download them today as I want to talk about a recent critique that Linus Torvalds had. He was not happy with the way that the REST formatting tool was operating, creating all sorts of jumbled messes when it came to indentation, calling for the following, can we please fix up whatever random heuristics that small items thing may make sense when you're talking things that are really our one common data structure, but the use directive is literally about independent things that get used and smushing them all together seems entirely wrong. I realize the number of users seem to just leave the repeated use kernel XYZ, use kernel ABC as separate lines, possibly because of the horrendous Rust format, random heuristic behavior signed off Linus. And he really went into this. If you want to follow this more along and go through the entire chain of events and what Linus said, because he had quite a few zingers in the last round of this, I do have a different video on this. I'm going to post a link in the description below. You can check that out if you're very interested. But if you're not, let's move on to the resolve because this has been resolved, at least been put in place in order to resolve this issue. And that is this latest pull request format fixes from Miguel Ojeda. Rust format by default formats imports in a way that is prone to conflicts while merging and rebasing since in some cases it condenses several items into the same line. Document in our guidelines that we will handle this for the moment with writing trailing empty comment workaround and make the tree rust format clean again. And we show how individual files would work. For instance, when you see a code block like this with the structure, notice example two, how it's combining everything together. This makes it really hard to watch and see the differences between files. So instead, now the kernel uses vertical layout following this format. So you see this code block, you see this structure and it's got example one, then example two and example two is breaking down at three, four, five, continued on to six, seven, and then eight, nine. And this directly addresses the complaint Linus Torvalds had, which we just discussed about Rust auto formatter, which repeatedly mangled import layouts in the Linux kernel. He was very upset with this as it was rewrapping and collapsing multiple imports, as we saw above here. And that made the tool lack stable, predictable formatting across the Linux kernel coding style expectations. Now we see this vertical import layout, which does not collapse. It makes sure to reorder the lines as necessary in the vertical format. This restores consistency, reduces that merge pain that Linus was seeing, and makes life a little easier for maintainers, including Linus Torvalds. Well, that's where we're gonna end it this week in Linux news. If you enjoy this type of video, make sure to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up. More to come so you wouldn't wanna miss it. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.